The white animals with the long straight horns are the Arabian oryx, and they were once almost completely extinct in the wild after World War II. Uh, the few animals that were remaining were captured. Since then, we've had over 150 births of the Arabian oryx, and as a result, we've been able to help reintroduce this animal back into its native homeland, places like Jordan and Oman. It's a very gratifying experience for everybody to be involved in that project because there are so few species that are in peril today that will be able to be released back into the wild. Not because no one is breeding that particular animal, because there's no wild to be returned back into. The urgency of the park's mission is amplified by scientific estimates that at least one species of plant or animal vanishes from the wild every day, and that that number will grow to one per hour by the end of this century. New arrivals are a major event at the zoo for the animals and people. This is the first day for these Chinese bears to be on exhibit. Now, as you can see, they're very anxious to make their debut here at the San Diego Zoo. They've been in quarantine for the past month. So you kids get out there and knock them dead, okay? four years to get these bears here. Anytime you have a cub or a new bear is going to exhibit, it is very exciting. And whether they're new arrivals from afar or long-standing favorites, all bears are expert crowd pleasers. your color. We will miss your curiosity. We will miss your children. Our children's children may never know you. Your strange striping, your towering physique, your shyness, and your humor. You will soon be gone gone forever. For hundreds of species of animals, these ominous thoughts loom as a very real possibility in their future. A future threatened by the loss of fields and forests. Unravel a complex web of life by which we all survive. In order to stop the rapid disappearance of so many creatures, 
a group dedicated to their preservation and repopulation came into being. CRESS, the Center for Reproduction of Endangered Species. A caring team of scientists and research associates spawning new hope for vanishing wildlife. CRESS is already accomplishing breakthroughs for such rare creatures as the cheetah, the rhinoceros, and the Przewalski's wild horse. Thanks in part to the efforts of Cress, the world watched as the first captive bred California condor chick broke through its shell. And the Arabian oryx has been reintroduced into the wild. Along with these species are thousands of others that are threatened or endangered. Through the help of Cress, these beautiful creatures may once again reproduce in the wild. But before that can happen, they need our help. The black rhinoceros once numbered as many as 60,000 in 1970. Now there are fewer than 3,200. More gazelles. Less than 100 exist in captivity. None remain in the wild. The American bald eagle, our national emblem. Once they reigned the width and breadth of California in abundance. Now only about 70 pairs can be counted in the state. Time is running out for these and other species. And unless action is taken now, extensively and quickly, their thousands of years on this earth will vanish. Cheetahs are very sensitive animals. They're difficult to breed in captivity. We have approximately 12 acres here set aside for the cheetahs. The reason that the breeding program is important to the cheetah population is uh, cheetahs are an endangered species. They're very difficult to breed in captivity, and it's important to just keep the species going. The cheetah is the world's fastest runner, able to reach speeds as high as 70 miles an hour. But ironically, it's almost been overtaken by extinction, a victim of poachers after its beautiful coat, and significant loss of its habitat to human civilization. We've had one of the better success rates in the country. In captivity, as we're learning more about these animals, I think we'll be able to, to do a better job of reproducing them. That's what we're here for, to make their day better. While we're here, we do the best we can to make it different and exciting and a nice place to be. 
what we've got here is holes drilled in the log, which they have to use their fingers or sticks to work on to get the sunflower seeds and raisins, which lengthens the time that it takes for them to eat their food. If they're eating, they're not bored. It's basically what these animals would be doing if they were in the wild, would be foraging, which is looking for food and eating. So this is just one way that we can come close to to duplicate the situation as it would be for them if they were living in the wild. A pair of Chinese golden monkeys were loaned to the San Diego Zoo for a five and a half month period beginning in November 1984. These animals were part of an exchange program with the Chengdu Zoo and had never before been exhibited outside of China. Their behavioral staff at the San Diego Zoo, with the help of Dr. Richard Tanaza from the University of the Pacific, took this rare opportunity to study the behavior of these unique primates. This videotape will show some of the most interesting behaviors that we observed during this study. Social grooming was frequently performed by these animals while they were on exhibit. Unlike most other primates, the female groomed the male during only about 20% of the total grooming sequences. Lip-snacking gestures were often made by the male during grooming. This is a behavior not usually observed in other langur species. The thumb of the golden monkey is quite small compared to the large forefinger used by the male to sort through his partner's fur during grooming. The female usually groomed the male only after he had mounted or groomed her first, although the duration of these grooming bouts were about the same as that of the males. In this feeding sequence, the pair is giving a duet call after the male attempts to grab some brows away from the female. just made a vocalization which appears to be an alarm call. This is the only call she makes that is always accompanied by an open mouth and some facial movement. The golden monkeys occasionally threaten visitors with stares and forward leaning movements. These threat patterns are very similar to that of the Duke Langers of Vietnam. The male has a pair of reddish flaps at the corner of his mouth which are visually quite striking and may also be secretory glands used to mark females of his harem. Golden monkeys are reported to live in small family groups which merge seasonally to form very large groups numbering in the hundreds. The male was often observed bumping his forehead and wiping the side of his face on the female's back. This may be a method of marking her. This crouching posture is used by the female to invite grooming or mating from her partner. In response to an invitation from the female, the male approaches, marks the female, and mates with her. You have to take care of their feet first and foremost. And captive elephants don't walk anywhere near as far as wild elephants, so they don't get the natural wear and tear on the feet. These are the nails of the elephant's rear feet, and uh, the cuticles where the sweat glands are are real important to keep them clean, not, not overgrown, and not dirty, and not rotten, of course. Keep the nails high and keep them flat, clean. And trimming off some of the excess pads, it gets a little, a few holes in it, and it starts to get debris build up there, so we trim it down so it's nice and flat.
some crickets for you today. Great. In addition to 700,000 crickets, the zoo's elegant dining selection includes 20 tons of bananas, 150,000 pounds of seafood, 60 tons of meat, plus other delicacies, such as over a million mealworms, and that's just a fraction of the zoo's annual grocery list. There's mealworms, there's ground dog food with chow chow, a mixture of seed. As you can see, their food is kind of squishy, so they do get the hard bone to chew on to keep those pearly whites nice and clean and sharp. gets a cup of this a day. If you uh, help food nut, you can probably eat it yourself because it contains everything in it that you would ever need. And it tastes good. But... <laughs> The quality you see there, uh, here is what we get every day. We get it in a shift in twice a week uh, to keep it fresh, to make sure it's turned over. It's the same quality you get at home. Oh, these guys might have got to be There has long been a controversy regarding the panda's heritage. Dr. Ollie Ryder is the San Diego Zoo geneticist. It was first named as a bear. Therein, after other people looked at the material, now basically an analysis of the skull, of the of the hands and so forth, and uh, there was some uh, uh, differences of opinion about really whether it was a bear or not. So one group of experts would say, well, it's clearly more raccoon-like, and others would say it's clearly more bear-like. Now, when you look where they fall on the family trees of carnivores, they fall smack dab with the bears. Because their habitat is shrinking in the wild, the giant panda is highly endangered. A massive die-off of their main food, bamboo, has left many pandas sick or starving. As a result, the Chinese government has set aside 11 preserves to protect their national treasure. Scientists are redoubling their efforts to find ways to save them. We are all involved in the effort. We connect with these animals, perhaps more uniquely than with some others. But that connection, we simply don't want to lose. We don't want our children to lose that connection. And so uh, that's reason enough, because we are now in charge. It's, our, it's up to us whether these animals survive or not. To many of the millions of visitors to the San Diego Zoo, the panda's six-month visit was much too short. As Bossy, Yen Yen, and their keepers board their United Airlines flight to Beijing, we all hope that these living symbols of the world's endangered species will be able to return for future generations.
Topiary is the art of shaping plants into geometric or animal forms. It draws attention to the animals, it draws attention to the plants as well, and it shows another whole dimension of what plants can do here at the zoo. He is the only albino koala that's ever been born in captivity. There's only one other albino, and she is in Australia, and she was born in the wild. So he's a real special animal.
my closest attachments has been with some of the gorillas and some of the orangs some time back. Alvila, the, the female that's over there now, I gave her her first bottle back in the 60s when she was born. After she was born, I went over the children's zoo that night, and they had a little, little bit of liquid that wanted me to get down her. And uh, she start to go to sleep, I'd pinch her foot just a little bit. She'd wake up and take a couple of drinks and go to sleep, and i work through the night that way. And by the time the children's zoo person come in the next morning, she'd take her fluid. Well, I kind of feel close to Alvila. You know. First one I saw when I started working here was his mother, and she was two. I've waited 20 years for this. I think he's pretty good. zoo giraffe shop.
questions at the same time. Well, when they zap your food, they both have to be on the item. Well, do you think she wants them on her hard to clean feathers? Uh-uh. She wants them on her easy to clean skin, and that's why she comes too close to her. And that's why I'm asking you to stay exactly where you are. now. This gives you a look at the backs of the cages that the keepers work while the visitors are here seeing the zoo. The windows that the visitors look through are at the front of the cage and the big double doors are at the back of the cage so that the keeper can reach in and work on these animals and do the things that he needs to do. The Fiji Island Iguana is an endangered species and we're very fortunate here at the zoo that we actually have bred them and raised up a couple of their young. We keep very accurate specimen histories on each one of our animals. Every animal has its own card where we keep a record of where it's at, what the temperature is in its cage, what kind of plants are in the cage, what kind of soil, what it's eating. Every three months we weigh these animals so that we can keep good track of what their weight is doing. If it starts losing weight, then we know that we need to either change its diet or the amount of diet it gets, or we need to consult a veterinarian. With reptiles, they don't show symptoms like mammals and birds do. They don't sneeze and uh, get droopy-eyed and, and look sick. And so we have to use the weight to do that. When you're working with something dangerous, the trick is knowing what you're doing. If you're experienced and you've been taught properly, you're not taking any chances. For some reason, possibly unexplainable, I found these animals so interesting. Maybe because they were so unusual and because they were so misunderstood. And the more I studied them, the more fascinating and wonderful that I uh, thought they were. And uh, I've been working with them ever since. privilege to be the privilege to the privilege to be able to have a part to play in preserving an animal as magnificent as the Pshavalsky horse or as a taper or as a gorilla or a the privilege to be able to have a part to play in preserving an animal as magnificent as the Pshavalsky horse or as a taper or as a gorilla or orangutan or any almost any of the species you can see here at the zoo. These are part of the, the treasure of biological resources of our planet, and they've been on the verge of extinction, and now they're coming back. And the, you know, the, the most fantastic thing would be able to participate in seeing that they go back into nature. That's really, that's really uh, one of the big goals. Without uh, zoos and with 
about the game preserve, certain animals will disappear uh, because uh, I believe in some years to come there really won't be wild animals. They will be managed in some way or other. Um, I like to be part of that. The world to me would be a very, very lonely place if we were the only species inhabiting it. And at the rate of extinction of species, which is about one a day right now, and by the year 2000, maybe one a minute, and those are rather accurate pro uh, projections, uh, we might be the last species, and indeed then we may ourselves be in jeopardy as our habitats become so imperiled by human activity. We have a tremendous opportunity to allow people to see the diversity, the wonders of the different types of life that exist on this planet, and thereby, we hope, to let them come to appreciate this more and to participate more actively in saving the wildlife, saving the forms of plants and animals that are in danger on our planet. We have um, over 420 species of birds, 1,800 individuals, which takes a, a lot of constant care and a lot of attention, a lot of observation time. We try to design exhibits to best mimic the natural setting of the animal, to take into consideration the reproductive needs of the animal, the dietary needs of the animal. So now, instead of the old cement and wire, we look at cement, wire, and everything else. And everything else is, is, the, is the, the trick. The philosophy is trying to balance the need of the public, the viewing public, with the need of the animal.
Very good. Very good bear. Hi. Do you like your belly scratched? plants Efforts to breed the southern white rhino have produced history-making results. If you look way out toward the middle of the enclosure, you'll see another southern white rhino out there with a little baby. He just turned seven weeks old. He's a real feisty little guy, too. I've seen him out here chasing the zebra sometimes. And when the zebras chase back, he just runs back and gets mom. The most prolific herd of white rhinos has helped remove these animals from the roster of endangered species. concentrated initially on bringing together as many endangered species as possible in this park because of the amount of room that was available we felt that we could do justice in a breeding program by keeping larger numbers of animals.
When I first came to the park, I realized it was really special, but it wasn't until I traveled to Africa and saw the animals living in the wild and they were doing the exact same things in the wild that they do here. So coming to work here is, is a privilege. To me, this is a hobby I get paid for. Each species represents different habits and needs, characteristics critical to survival. The park staff has to know what all those different needs are and how to meet them. In the case of finicky diets, it can mean going out and growing your own. Okay, this is the acacia browse that uh, is native to Africa. We grow it here at the Wild Animal Park so that we can cut it fresh every day for the animals. It's used not as a, a primary source of nutrition, but more as a supplement for the animals. I mentioned the feeder tree out there. Uh, the keepers put alfalfa in the basket, and then they hang fresh acacia browse from the limb every day for the giraffe. That's generally how giraffe feed. They do feed from the treetop. Unfortunately, a lot of the wild habitats of many, many species are disappearing for various reasons, uh, population explosions and, and what have you. So we may be one of the last bastions of survival for some of these species. We try to do the park on a geographical our basis. So the animals you see together are animals that you would see within a certain geographical area and of course we have to give ourselves some liberty and be a little bit flexible otherwise uh, we wouldn't be able to put as many things together because they don't all occur for example in the same country but they do occur within a geographical area, a landmass. five days a week for how many years, a number of years, and you, you can't help but take care and wonder how they're doing, if they're doing well, and you, you, that attachment, that, that fondness that you have for your animals your, in your care, can't help but make you have that maternal feeling, whether you're male or female. You know. There's a lot of times I go through the zoo and a week would go by and I, I think to myself, you know, I haven't even noticed any animals around me because I don't pay attention to the animals as much. Just as spectacular and exotic as the zoo's animals are its more than 7,000 species of plants collected from around the world since the zoo's earliest days. During the 30s, uh, Dr. Harry made, I think, three trips around the world and then a complete trip of South America. And he collected seeds on all of these trips and came back and uh, brought them back to the zoo. A lot of these things wouldn't grow. Some of them didn't, but a lot of them did. So that's why we have uh, the start of the botanical collection that's in the zoo. is a rock outcropping. It's from the uh, grass area of you know, Central Africa. So there are certain animals that live in that type of environment. We've taken the same type of 
plant life that would be in that uh, in a copy and adapt it to this exhibit here. Like the African coffee, more and more zoo exhibits in the future will combine plants, mammals, birds, and reptiles in complete environments that replicate their native habitats. It was the presence of these animals that first sparked the idea of a San Diego Zoo. A collection left over from the 1916 World's Fair, the animals faced an uncertain future until the roar of a lion captured the attention and the imagination of a passing motorist, Dr. Harry Wegefort. He was uh, going downtown with his brother Paul. My dad commented, he said, somebody ought to start a zoo. And Paul said, why don't you? And that was the gist of it. And start a zoo he did. Dr. Harry, recognized today as one of the pioneers of the modern zoos in America, formed what is now the largest non-profit zoological society in the world, and a zoological park that continues to enchant millions of visitors every year. The zoo's hospital complex houses the important work of a team of researchers, veterinarians, and animal keepers. We have probably the most diverse, multi-talented program of any zoo in the world, bringing scientific disciplines to bear on the needs of these animals. I'm director of research uh, in the Center of Reproduction of Endangered Species, which is the zoo's research department, which aims to get all the knowledge necessary to establish self-sustaining populations of endangered species in captivity, with the hope that ultimately we return some of these animals to the wild, provided there is a wild preserved habitat for them. We interact, of course, with the curators and with the clinical veterinarians. The curators will actually provide us access to the animals. If we're investigating infectious disease problems, the veterinarians are the first to bring these to our attention. And then also, again, provide us the sample materials necessary in the laboratory to identify the disease in question, which is causing a health problem. What's the scenario going to be in the, you know, for the hospital? This one? We've got the spring buck to do first, and the munchak, and then the pygmy yeah, chimps after that. Coming up after that. Okay, and the deal with those guys is just regular processing because you know, we want to give them their physical exams and TB test them and uh, take some specimens for some investigative studies for mycobacterial infections. These are lion-tailed macaques, which come from India, and it's one of the most endangered of the macaque species. There are probably only about a thousand of them left in existence in the wild. There are several zoos that have them captive breeding programs, and we're one of them, and I think we have one of the largest collections of any in captivity. One lion-tailed macaque offers an inspiring example of human and animal determination. Um, Kim is three years old and he has cerebral palsy. Um, he lived with his mother for about 13 months, and then we had to separate him from his mom because she was nursing him, and her milk was no longer nutritious enough to sustain him. And we started hand feeding him, and we still do that. We hand feed him twice a day. Um, he's doing quite well. During the time that we've been hand feeding him, he's gained about three and a half pounds. In an animal like Kim, an animal diagnosed with cerebral palsy would not survive. Uh, Kim cannot climb, and in the wild, these animals spend about 80% of their time in the trees. So just the fact that he couldn't climb would definitely have killed him. And we have physical therapists who come in and work with him. We also do exercises with him in an attempt to get him to move better. When we first pulled him away from his mom, he couldn't even use his back legs. He simply dragged them behind him and now he can walk as well as run. So one of the things that we've done for Kim is we've built this special ramp in the cage. This ramp starts down at the bottom and goes up to the nest box, which is a sleeping area for the animals at night. And Kim now can climb up and sleep with the animals in the nest box. And he gets along quite well socially in the group. I, I think on some level they sense that he has a handicap. The other animals respect him.
and they're ready for bed. They master the, an escape plan and they can get out, so we take them in in the evening. We're outside the uh, Southeast Asian Langer building, which is where we exhibit our langers during the day. At night, which is what I do in late lockup, is uh, bring the animals in and have them eat their dinner, make sure they're okay, and lock them up, which is upstairs. And uh, in the morning, if the other keeper comes in and lets them out during the day into the uh, exhibit where the people can also observe them. people wanted another giraffe or another uh, rhinoceros, they could simply go to the wild. They could buy the animal from an animal dealer who obtained it from the wild. Now that's no longer the case. In the last year, just the last year, half the rhinoceroses on the planet have disappeared. They're disappearing entirely. If they're going to persist, something is going to have to be done. Zoos, for some of these species, may be able to play a role, a small role in preserving some species so that they can be reintroduced to habitats in the future. The Chevalsky horse behind me here is an example. This is a species that's extinct in the wild. If the species is going to persist on our planet, uh, we're going to have to breed it successfully because all the Chevalsky horses in the world come from only 13 animals that came from the wild. We have to be very careful about the breeding of these animals so that we don't get them unnecessarily inbred and so that we avoid genetic diseases and factors like this. And this is true for many other species besides the Chevalsky horse. Two adults, two children. Bus, nursery, sky ride both ways, and a map of the park. Thank you. Bye-bye. So wide awake. It's hours before the first visitors arrive. A time for morning greetings and the day's first meal. People look at these animals and they see an animal that sleeps up to a day. And it's kind of difficult to recognize that an animal that sleeps that much can actually have a personality, but they really do. They're very unique animals, too, and so they're really fascinating. They're actually marsupials rather than bears. Um, a lot of times people call them bears. Um, that probably originated because they look sort of like teddy bears. 